the notion that one generation ultimately gives way to the next and there's a succession of them, which has hitherto been human history, is coming to an end. The leaders of today, the group that uh, pompous title but includes me in this symposium, aren't going anywhere. We intend to stay around for decades, if not centuries to come. So the generation that's coming up behind us will be uh, integrated into our generation. It won't be the succession. And we see an awful lot of that today. You know, uh, the young people here, in many cases, had far more conservative positions, speaking into the debate that I was just in and just generally at the symposium, than the older people have had. That's a complete reversal of the standard of the last century, which was a drift towards conservatism as you get older. What I think uh, this generation is showing is that they started out so uh, disoriented about what the future was going to hold that they clung to very traditional values and are slowly opening their minds to the fact that the future will be very, very different from what they thought it was going to be. We're going to see, for the first time really in history, a kind of synergy. Well, I won't say the first time. The first time in history this happened, actually, uh, is why we are here today and our Neanderthal cousins are not. I wrote a lot about Neanderthals. Uh, our ancestors were the first hominid uh, species to develop grandparents, to have not only just parents, but the parents' parents live into the life of the children. And it provided for intergenerational transfer of wisdom, hunting wisdom, folklore, all that sort of stuff, and also differentiation of labor. Uh, because when you have twice the number of adults, parents plus parents' parents, looking after the children, people can specialize. So that was what gave us this great impetus that let us win the great primate competition of, of uh, 100,000 years ago. Um, and today we're seeing the second time that's happened. We're seeing the last generation that is ever going to die is alive now. The first generation that is going to live in a very extended, if not infinite, lifespan is also alive now. And this idea of clashes of generations, the, the, the notion of a, what is a generation? 20 years, some would say, 50 years at the outside. The 21st century might be a generation. The third millennium might be a generation. And it will be a cooperation between young and old, a synergistic uh, pooling of resources rather than any sort of conflict. So the clash of generations, right at the title, I have problem with the symposium. This is the, uh, the confluence of generations, a celebration of all of us coming together and providing uh, the vigor of youth, the wisdom of old age perhaps, and creating something in terms of societies greater than any that have previously existed on this planet. We've always talked about the uh, turnover of generations being required for, say, political reform, for instance. But I was born in 1960. And in 1960 in the United States, now I'm a Canadian, but in the United States they had segregation. Blacks and whites weren't allowed to use the same public facilities. The rights of women were very limited in the United States in 1960. We have seen in one lifetime, and I hope a very small portion of that one lifetime, we have seen a complete change. And it's not because young people came up and said, you know what, all you racist old fogies were wrong. It's because the racist old fogies changed their mind. What we have learned through uh, what you know, has been called the greatest generation, post-World War II uh, generation, is that human nature does change and it doesn't require killing off the previous uh, cohort to make room for new ideas. We actually are nimble and we learn and grow as people. And that's been the wonderful lesson of my generation. We have in my lifetime seen the three greatest civil rights turns in human history. Um, we've seen the, the civil rights movement, the recognition that skin color is irrelevant. You know, you got judge people by the content of their character. The women's rights movement and the gay rights movement. The one that is about to happen, that a lot of science fiction is still dealing with, is when we start no longer defining personhood on a biological basis. So it will be the rights of artificially intelligent machines, the rights of uh, animals that have consciousness and sentience either naturally or that we have uplifted into having those capabilities. Uh, we've, we are transitioning 
Uh, in this era, and science fiction is mapping out the possibilities that'll come down the pike, giving up carbon chauvinism, giving up the belief that you have to be born of man and woman to be a person. We will see all kinds of people who aren't biological entities in the coming decades. And that's certainly one of the areas that science fiction is vigorously exploring now, just as we vigorously explore genetic engineering and transparency and privacy and, uh, versus totalitarianism in decades gone by, so that when we are actually faced with the issues directly, we're not at sea. We have some road maps to help us, or, or oceanic maps, to help us find our way uh, to where we want to be.